There's a passage in the novel, Joseph and His Brothers, where Joseph has been thrown into prison. And so with nothing else to do, he starts interpreting his own dreams. He starts interpreting the dreams of his fellow prisoners. He starts interpreting the dreams of the wardens. of the person in charge of the prison. And ultimately, when the pharaoh has his dream about the seven lean cows eating the seven fat cows, and no one else can interpret it, Joseph is brought in to interpret the pharaoh's dream. And that's how he got out of prison. At first it looked like he was cornered. There was no way out. But it's by looking inside and developing his own internal resources, that's how he found his way out. We have a similar example in the life of John Lee that's actually more relevant to our purposes right now. He'd gone into the forest. He wanted to get away for three months. And a younger monk had said he'd found a really nice secluded place way up in the forest. It required three days to walk in. He got there, and within a couple of days he had a heart attack. So he was cornered. There was no way to get out of there except to walk out, and with his heart in that condition, it was going to be hard. Impossible, basically. So what did he have? He had his breath. He had his attitude. In technical terms, this would be fabrication. What he was doing in the present moment was going to make all the difference. Because outside circumstances were not helping at all, he was totally thrown on his internal resources. How he breathed, how he talked to himself, the images he had in mind, the feelings he could develop through the breath. It was because of these things he was able to pull himself together and strengthen his heart to the point where at the end of the three months, when the rains retreat was over, he could walk out three days. He lived for another eight years. So here we are, sitting for an hour, thinking of yourself as cornered right here. You're going to stay in this position. And the difference between suffering right now and having a sense of ease and well-being right now is going to depend on your own inner resources, the way you fabricate your experience right now. You might say, necessity becomes the mother of invention. What are you going to do? We've got John Lee's guidance about working with the breath. And you've got the Buddha's recommendations for working with the breath, and you've got his recommendations for ways to talk to yourself, questions to ask about what you're doing right now, what you could change about what you're doing. And so take advantage of that, because someday the body will have you cornered. Illness will come, aging will come, death will approach. And the usual ways you have of diverting yourself and distracting yourself, getting up, moving around, fantasizing about this, that, and the other thing, those are going to be no longer available. And you'll be thrown back on how you fabricate your experience immediately, right here, right now. Now some people will try to escape just into fantasy worlds, worlds of delusion, dementia. But those are really unsafe. Especially when death comes, you want to have your wits about you. You want to be clear about what you're doing. Because choices will come. And if you're mindful, alert, ardent, you can resist the temptation to go places that will not be conducive to the practice. You can direct yourself to 
either places that will be conducive to the practice, or you can deal with what's coming up in the mind right then and there and gain release. That's possible, too. But it all depends on how you fabricate your experience here in the present moment. So what have you got? You've got the breath. You can breathe long, short, fast, slow, heavy, light, deep, shallow. Then you can ask questions, which of those ways of breathing is best right now? That gets into verbal fabrication, direct a thought and evaluation. You direct your thoughts to the breath, and then you evaluate it. What kind of breathing is best right now? It would be most conducive to sitting here with a sense of ease and well-being for the whole hour. And what ways of breathing are antithetical to that? One thing I felt find helpful is not to breathe out in a way that feels like you're squeezing the energy out of the body. Sometimes there's a cartoon idea in the in the mind that you've got to squeeze the breath energy out like you're squeezing toothpaste out of a tube. And there's no way you're going to develop a sense of fullness that way. So don't breathe in and let the body breathe out on its own. You don't have to squeeze out the breath. Another thing to watch out for is the moments between the breaths. Instead of trying to squeeze the end of the breath to make a marker that now the out-breath has ended or now the in-breath has ended, use that moment of poise between the in-breath and the out-breath to spread your awareness and spread a sense of well-being, stillness through the body. And you notice that as you're doing this, you're engaging not only in verbal fabrication and bodily fabrication, but also mental fabrication, your perceptions, the images you hold in mind of the breath as a whole body process. That is the body not as just a big lump of flesh, but as a body of breath energy. Then you can ask yourself, are the breath channels in this body connected, or are they or the plug's been pulled out. Okay, where can you plug them back into one another again? Because when everything is plugged in, you create a really good energy field right here. It fills the body and also can surround the body as well. We were talking earlier this afternoon about going to places with negative energy. You can try to create a good energy field in your body. And it becomes a protective shield. When you fill the body with good energy, negative energies can't get in. And then you think thoughts are goodwill. That's another way of using verbal and mental fabrication. Whatever the source of the negative energy outside, may that source be happy. You have no ill will toward it. And from there you can spread goodwill to everybody. This too is a skillful verbal and mental fabrication. And so as you're cornered right here, you find that you do have these resources inside where you can make a difference right now. This is a very important lesson. Because sometimes when you hear about the way Vipassana is explained, it gets fatalistic, that you have to put up with whatever is there because, after all, causes and condition have decreed that this is what you've got to experience right now. If there's a pain right there, you've got to put up with it. That gives no role to the function of your intentions and your fabrication right here, right now. But at the same time, you can't believe that you can change everything as you want it right here, right now. There will be limitations. If there were no limitations, there would be no need to try to find something unfabricated. You just sit here and make skillful fabrications and turn pain into pleasure, turn the desert into a lush paradise, just simply with the thought. It doesn't work that way. You will find that there will be parts of the body that don't cooperate. 
We will learn how to work around them. It's in exploring how you fabricate right here, right now, that you begin to sense what in your experience right now is the result of past karma that can't be changed, and what is the result of your present karma that can be changed. That's an important distinction. What are the limits of well-being that fabrication can create, and where do those limits constrict you? In other words, what is the area within those limits that you can create well-being, and then where do you find you're running up against a brick wall? This is how you develop your discernment. Discernment means seeing distinctions. And it's easy to say everything is in, fabricated is in constant stress, well, not self, and just say, okay, well, what next? What does that mean? What do you do with that insight? That insight is useful only in the context of figuring out what you can do in terms of either the Four Noble Truths, dependent core arising. If you look at dependent core arising, right next to ignorance is fabrication, these three kinds of fabrication. And there's a passage where the Buddha says you can look at any one of the links in dependent core arising. If you bring knowledge to it, then you can cut the connection that would lead to suffering. What does it mean to bring knowledge? Well, it means bring knowledge to how you fabricate around that issue. So it brings you back to that first connection. Either from ignorance is going to be conditioning your fabrication or knowledge is going to be conditioning it. So you want to bring knowledge of what's skillful and what's not skillful. Insight is not a matter of understanding the nature of things, it's understanding the nature of actions, the nature of cause and effect. And how do you understand cause and effect? Well, you experiment. You try to develop a skill, and you find yourself running up against your lack of skill here and there, and over time you begin to realize there are some things that you actually can change. You can develop more skill in some, some areas, and other areas it's just beyond you. In other words, this is where you run up and you discover the limitations of fabrication within yourself. And that kind of knowledge is much more useful than just a blanket where well, everything fabricated is in constant stress, well, not self, and so we just drop, drop everything. Think of the Buddha's image of the raft going across the river. If everything is constant stress, well, not self, and you would let go of it, what are you going to build your raft out of? All you've got are inconstant, stressful, and not self things. But you do have some control over them, and you can make them easeful, more lasting than other things, to at least some extent, enough to get you across the river. So having yourself cornered like this throws you back on your resources and you begin to realize, what do you have here? What can you make out of this? The Buddha says you can make your breath, your thoughts, your perceptions, your feelings into a path. Now if you listen to that possibility with an ordinary, everyday mind, you may say, well, maybe some other time. I have other things that are more pressing right now. Which is why it's good to corner yourself like this on a regular basis. Sitting still for a whole hour is not a natural thing to do. But it does force you, throws you back on your resources. And you find that you can develop the skill that makes sitting here for an hour a really pleasant thing, an experience that clarifies what's going on in the mind. Your breath and your thoughts can become a path, a path to the end of suffering. That's 
quite a possibility. So for me and Sergio, you have to be cornered? Okay, corner yourself. Force yourself to explore these dimensions of your experience. And you have something really valuable to take away from the hour. <laughs>